your nomination for president. I accept your nomination for the presidency of the United States. Today, all U.S. citizens 18 or older have the constitutional right to register and vote for the candidate of their choice in national, state, and local elections. But this hasn't always been the case. Historically, people have created all sorts of roadblocks and reasons for why some of us shouldn't be allowed to vote. Reasons like... You're a woman. You're an immigrant. You have to live here 21 years before you can register. You're a Negro. You're an Indian. If you can't recite the Constitution perfectly, then you can't register. After the signing of the Declaration of Independence in 1776, each of the new states wrote constitutions in which they limited the right to vote to white males who owned property. In a few cases, religion might be a condition for voting. But the real emphasis was on wealth and the ownership of property. In South Carolina, for example, you need $10,000 in currency to be governor, $2,000 to be senator. To be elected to the House of Representatives, you must believe in God and the existence of heaven and hell. But the idea of property-based voting is hotly debated. The right of voting for a representative is the primary right by which others are protected. To take away this right is to reduce a man to a state of slavery. For slavery consists in being subject to the will of another. And he that does not have a right to vote in the election of a representative is a slave. Depend on it, sir. It is dangerous to open so fruitful a source of controversy and altercation as would be opened by attempting to alter the qualifications of voting. There will be no end to it. Women will demand a vote. Lads from 12 to 21 will think their rights not enough attended to. And every man who has not a farthing will demand an equal voice with any other in all acts of state. But in the early years of the country, property-based suffrage does allow some blacks and women to vote, though this right is later taken away. The belief was uh, uh, at the founding of the Republic uh, that people should vote uh, who had a stake in society. And that stake was generally measured in terms of property. The qualification was not a racial uh, one, uh, but it was uh, an economic one. At the Constitutional Convention of 1787, Morris of Pennsylvania argues in favor of tying the right to vote to land ownership. Oliver Ellsworth of Connecticut disagrees. Ought not every man who pays a tax vote for the representative who is to levy and dispose of his money? Yeah, 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 yeah. Give the votes to people who have no property, yeah, yeah. and they will sell them to the rich who will be able to buy them. The convention ultimately decides to let each state write its own guidelines for voting, and these guidelines vary widely from state to state. Vermont has full manhood suffrage, and its only requirements for voting are a year's residence and quiet and peaceable behavior. Kentucky's constitution specifically excludes Negroes, mulattoes, and Indians. Connecticut's guidelines for voting include owning property, a higher age requirement, and a good moral conduct qualification, which essentially means you have to belong to the established church. From 1790 to the beginning of the Civil War in 1860, rules for voting rights gradually become more restrictive for all but white males. Racism and democracy uh, seem to advance uh, hand in hand in the early republic. And uh, during the uh, first the three uh, decades uh, of the 19th century, as uh, suffrage, uh, as property qualifications began to fall uh, more generally, and as states uh, instituted uh, uh, universal suffrage, they also uh, inserted the word the white in that. So you had uh, adult uh, uh, male white uh, suffrage and those blacks uh, who could vote uh, under the old uh, property holding uh, standard uh, lost, uh, lost their vote. Apart from a few Midwestern states hungry for settlers, most states restrict voting rights for immigrants. In the West, Asians are excluded and immigrants in the Northeast, mostly Irish Catholics, are forced to pass lengthy residency tests for voting and office holding. In the years leading up to the Civil War, abolitionists and suffragists worked together to abolish slavery in the South. In 1848, a year of revolution in Europe and Mexico, 
and the year the Communist Manifesto was signed, 300 people gather in a church in Seneca Falls, New York to discuss the status of women. The most revolutionary item on the agenda is voting. In that year, uh, a woman named Elizabeth Cady Stanton and uh, her mentor, a woman named Lucretia Mott, who was a Quaker and an anti-slavery activist, held a, organized a small, a small meeting in Seneca Falls, New York, then this convention was different than others in that it concentrated entirely on women's rights. And the most controversial demand was the demand for the right to vote, which most of the rather radical attendees were wary of uh, signing on to. Elizabeth Stanton's controversial resolution read, Resolve that it is the duty of the women of this country to secure to themselves their sacred right to the elective franchise. The convention and Stanton's resolution are dismissed by the public and widely ridiculed in the press. But the first shots are fired in a battle that would last another 72 years before women win the right to vote. With the Civil War over, the country's attention focuses on bringing American blacks into mainstream life. At this time, blacks cannot vote in the South or in most of the North. Ironically, only six northern states at this time permit blacks to vote. In the years following the Civil War, Congress approved several major pieces of legislation designed to protect the civil rights of blacks and to sweep from power those Southerners who fought with the Confederacy and supported slavery. Republicans who control Congress hope that giving blacks the vote will attract them to the Republican Party and assure their majority in Congress. The ballot is also seen as a weapon to protect blacks against violence and intimidation. In January of 1866, Congress passes a civil rights bill which, for the first time, defines citizenship and prohibits discrimination based on race. President Andrew Johnson vetoes the bill. Federal protection of black civil rights and the broad conception of national power behind it constitutes a stride towards centralization and the concentration of all legislative power in the national government. The distinction of race and color is by the bill made to operate in favor of the colored and against the white race. Congress overrides the president's veto and enacts the civil rights bill into law. Former slaves quickly take advantage of their newly gained rights. As word filters down about what the Congress has done as far as the new Reconstruction Acts, they've organized meetings, they're petitioning, they're having uh, conventions, uh, uh, they're choosing uh, leaders. Violence against blacks in the South continues. Race riots in Memphis and New Orleans leave blacks dead in the streets. The Radical Republican Congress responds by passing the 14th Amendment to the Constitution to further strengthen Negro rights. The amendment says all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. Once they do get the vote, they vote in incredible numbers. Uh, in short, the suffrage is viewed as something extraordinarily important. It's a means to many ends uh, for black uh, people. Uh, they identified it as part and parcel of uh, freedom, and they take advantage of it as soon as they can. The Congress goes even further. It begins to work on the 15th Amendment that says, a citizen's right to vote cannot be abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. This radical new amendment is met with resistance in the South as well as opposition from some Northern conservatives. I do not believe that the Negro race and white race can mingle in the exercise of political power and bring good results to society. We are different. The difference is morally and intellectually, and I do not believe that we can mingle successfully in the management of government. Sir, it is impossible in the very nature of things that such a large portion of citizens of the United States as the black portion now are can for any considerable length of time remain in our midst without enjoying the right of suffrage. As soon as blacks can vote, they run for office and are successful in being elected. This lithograph shows members of the 41st and 42nd Congress. South Carolina's first post-Civil War state legislature has a black majority. B.S. Pinchback of Louisiana becomes the first black governor in American history, and Jonathan J. Wright is placed on the Louisiana State Supreme Court. 
But the period in which blacks can vote with relative security is short. Ku Klux Klan violence escalates. Lynchings and other forms of intimidation are used to discourage blacks from voting. By 1876, both the North and the South are tired of the quarreling and violence that has accompanied the reconstruction of the South. So the Republicans and Democrats strike a compromise. Republicans maintain control of the White House, and in return, Southern Democrats are assured that federal forces will be withdrawn from the South. But the Negro is the victim of this historic compromise. Without federal protection, blacks become second-class citizens. And by the 1890s, this short experiment in social and political equality comes to an end. For the next 80 years, lynchings, literacy tests, understanding clauses, and other roadblocks suppress black voting. But what about women? Yeah. How did black men get the vote and not women? The Republican Party that was in control of the, uh, of the government could see that black men in the South would vote Republican and would help control uh, the ex-Confederates. But women around the country, uh, white women in particular, had no such partisan advantage. So um, they, were, they, were, they allowed themselves, the Republican leaders allowed themselves to be sort of pushed into the position of supporting black suffrage but they would not in any way support women's suffrage. And women suffragists who had started out with both of these goals of um, the abolition of slavery and the uh, enfranchisement of freed men and women and the enfranchisement of white women found themselves having to, in a, the horrible position of having to choose between these two goals. What is Susan B. Anthony's response to waiting for suffrage until black men are enfranchised? I will cut off this right arm before I will ever work for or demand the ballot for the Negro and not the woman. Much to the horror of Anthony and other suffragists, the 14th Amendment inserts the word male into the Constitution for the first time. The second clause protects the rights of any of the male inhabitants of such state. But Anthony and other suffragists decide on a broader interpretation of the 14th and 15th Amendments. They decide that because the 14th Amendment defines any persons born or naturalized in the U.S. as citizens, that they are citizens and therefore constitutionally entitled to the right to vote. So, so she voted and she was completely thrilled. She wrote a letter to Elizabeth Stanton and said, I've done it, I've gone and voted, it feels great, you should go do it. And she was elated. And two or three weeks later, there's a knock on the door, it's a U.S. federal marshal who announces that she's in violation of federal legislation that had been passed to control and prohibit the votes of Confederates, that is to say, traitors. Mary Ann Chad Carey's a good example of that in Washington, D.C. Uh, the interesting thing is Carey was able to register. They allowed her to register to vote, but when she went to vote, they wouldn't take her ballot. From the early 70s on, you can repeatedly find examples of women and I've discovered not only in this country but around the world who engage in this what you'd have to call direct action voting. So this was a very elegant and constitutionally well-informed form of civil disobedience. The suffrage movement is made up of a wide variety of remarkable women. Paulina Davis publishes one of the first periodicals devoted to the women's rights movement. Mary Livermore averages 150 lectures annually on women's suffrage for 23 years. Belva Ann Lockwood is nominated for President of the United States in 1884 by the National Equal Rights Party. Get down, Belva. Abigail Scott Dunaway leads the suffrage struggle in the Pacific Northwest and is the first Oregon woman to register to vote. Ida B. Wells from Chicago is one of my favorite people, period. Okay, And one of the reasons that I admired her suffrage activities is that she had young children, a young baby at the time. And she would pack that baby up and go to political meetings and the women would, would be notified ahead of time and they'd find a babysitter to watch her baby while she would go and uh, talk to the women and encourage them to vote. And I think that that's very significant for the early 20th century where getting around with a young child is, was a lot more difficult than it is today. The suffragists travel from state to state to persuade male legislators to give women the vote. They lobby Teddy Roosevelt at his Sagamore Hill home. Harriet Stanton Blatch appears on Wall Street and presents her case to hundreds. 
Alice Paul and her supporters picket the U.S. Capitol and the White House. They also burn the words of President Woodrow Wilson, who doesn't support them until 1919. 20 million women are denied the right to vote, and you, President Wilson, are the chief opponent of their enfranchisement. They are arrested and jailed in large numbers. But the most successful form of public demonstrations is the suffrage parades that take place in New York City, Chicago, Washington, D.C., and other cities. At first, women ride in cars because walking alone might give the appearance they are streetwalkers or women of low moral standards. By 1912, thousands march in New York City. Many wear white and carry bright colored banners identifying their hometowns and sometimes their professions. In 1912, the New York Times reports that 10,000 men and women march for suffrage. They also run an editorial arguing against votes for women. The movement must be quelled, if it is to be quelled at all, by the men. They must make it plain to women that they intend to retain possession of the government. For the next seven years, women work hard for a constitutional amendment. In 1920, the 19th Amendment of the Constitution is ratified. Denial of the right to vote in any election on the grounds of sex is prohibited. So blacks get the vote. And women get the vote. What about Native Americans? Good question. In 1924, an act of Congress makes U.S. citizens of all Native Americans. But they're not allowed to vote in New Mexico and Arizona because of a provision which does not require Indians to pay taxes on trust status lands. In 1947, Miguel Trujillo, a Native American ex-Marine sergeant and school teacher, tries to register to vote in New Mexico. He is refused because he is an Indian. Trujillo sues the state, and a panel of federal judges decides that since Indians do pay most other taxes, New Mexico's rules amount to taxation without representation. After 36 years of statehood, New Mexico is forced to grant its Native American citizens the right to vote in state and local elections. In the 1950s, most U.S. citizens over 21 have the constitutional right to vote, but many of the southern states have such restrictive rules to register that blacks are in reality disenfranchised. In response, the Eisenhower administration begins work on the Civil Rights Act of 1957. In the spring of 1957, a young Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. speaks at a civil rights rally in Washington, D.C. Give us the ballot, he says, and we would transform the misdeeds of bloodthirsty mobs into the calculated good deeds of ordinary citizens. Give us the ballot, and we would fill our legislative halls with men of goodwill. Give us the ballot, and we would place judges on the benches of the South who will do justly and love mercy. So when the Eisenhower administration came in, uh, President Eisenhower uh, pledged himself to remove discrimination in all, uh, based on color in all areas uh, where the federal government was responsible. And of course, the most important one was the uh, question of voting rights. Uh, there had been attempts made uh, all through the years uh, to uh, remedy the uh, situation and allow a blacks to vote without fear. Uh, but they were always killed off in the Congress by filibuster in the Senate. Uh, just They have the unlimited voting, uh, unlimited speaking rule there, so they would just talk it to death. Civil rights supporters prevail, and Congress passes the first Civil Rights Act since Reconstruction, giving increased federal protection to black voters. But it isn't enough. Black demands for equal treatment multiply, and violence against blacks escalates. Blacks are arrested for demonstrating, and police use fire hoses and police dogs to break up marches. In 1963, thousands marched to the nation's capital demanding equal rights. The tension comes to a head in Selma, Alabama on Sunday, March 7, 1965. John Lewis, now a U.S. congressman, helps lead nearly 600 people on a march to highlight their demands to register and vote. They march across the Edmund Pettus Bridge and into a line of Alabama state troopers. But they came toward us in a, in a rush, great rush, uh, tramping us, beating us with nightsticks and bullwhip, and tramping us with horses. And then they released the tear gas. Uh, several of us were hurt. To this day, I don't know how I made it back across the bridge, across the Alabama River, through the through downtown Selma, back to Brown Chapel Emmy Church. 
But I do recall being back at the church and someone asked me, did I want to say something? And I stood up and said something to the effect, I don't understand how President Johnson can send troops to Vietnam and cannot send troops to South Alabama to protect people who only desires to register to vote. A week later, President Lyndon Johnson, a Southern Democrat, sends a voting rights bill to Congress. He delivers a speech to a joint session of Congress that is broadcast on national television. Many of the issues of civil rights are very complex and most difficult. But about this, there sh can and should be no argument. Every American citizen must have an equal right to vote. Congress passes the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which abolishes literacy tests as a requirement for voting and enforces rights previously denied by local officials. Black civil rights leaders, once beaten and jailed in the South, now join President Johnson as he signs these protections into law. The 60s in the United States is a time of rapid change. The Beatles revolutionize music and take America by storm. Mini skirts, hippies, Hendrix, Kate Ashbery, and body paint are all in. The decade begins with the election of the youngest president in history. Let the word go forth from this time and place to friend and foe alike that the torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans. The election of John Kennedy creates a new activism and a renewed sense of interest in politics among young people. The nonviolent activism of Martin Luther King Jr. attracts them to marches and voter registration drives in the South. The 1968 presidential campaigns of Robert Kennedy, Eugene McCarthy, and Richard Nixon bring thousands of college students into presidential politics. But nothing fans the flames of activism more than Vietnam. 18-year-old men are being drafted to fight in Southeast Asia. America is divided. The evening news is filled with pictures of students marching, seizing school buildings, being arrested, and tear gassed. I think one of the things that produced that movement that created the 18-year-old voting right uh, was the war in Vietnam. We had uh, hundreds of thousands of young people uh, fighting in Vietnam. At one point, our armies over there were in excess of 500,000 people. And I heard the argument uh, frequently made that if young people are old enough to fight and die for their country, they're old enough to vote. Congress introduces legislation to lower the voting age to 18. Former U.S. Senator Birch Bayh chaired the Senate subcommittee that drafted legislation lowering the voting age. I mean, when someone is 18 in this day and age, uh, they begin to accept the responsibilities of citizenship. Uh, many people have full-time jobs when they reach age 18. Uh, they're paying taxes. They begin to uh, raise families. And uh, they begin to be affected more directly and personally by what their government does. All the more reason for them to have a right to vote. Lowering the voting age for federal elections in 1970 adds roughly 11 million eligible voters between the ages of 18 and 21. President Nixon signs the measure into law, but does not feel Congress has the constitutional authority to lower the voting age on its own. The Supreme Court agrees with the president, and Justice Hugo Black, in a majority opinion, writes that Congress can regulate the voting age in a national, but not state, elections. Within six months, Congress passes and three-fourths of the states ratify the 26th Amendment forbidding the denial of the right to vote of any citizen on account of age if such citizen is 18 years or older. Two centuries of legal and individual struggle has brought universal suffrage to all Americans over 18, but today one massive obstacle remains, and that is apathy. George McGovern was the Democratic candidate for president in 1972, the first year that 18-year-olds across the nation could vote in a presidential election. One of the uh big disappointments to me in 1972 was the small percentage of eligible first-time voters who actually voted. Uh, even on college campuses, I was amazed to find that on some of the better campuses in this country, 10, 11, 12 percent of those eligible to vote actually participated in that election. 
The percentage of all eligible voters 18 to 24 years old who voted in 1980 was 33%, 34% in 1984, and 29% in 1988. This same downward trend continues today. Well, I tell young people um, to believe in something, uh, to, to, have, to have a dream, uh, to have a vision of the future to lose themselves in something that is much larger, much bigger than they are. Forget about their own circumstances and get involved in the circumstances of others. They should recognize that they still have their lives ahead of them. So issues like the environment are uh, of more importance to them than they are to uh, uh, older people who may not be around for decades uh, to come. And they should, uh, they should vote. It's your vote, and only you can use it. Each election brings you the chance to help change the world around you. In the past, ballots have been cast to set the driving age, the minimum wage, federal funding for your high school or college. Even the quality standards for the water you drink and the air you breathe is determined by the people you vote into office. Your vote counts. It's your right and your responsibility to use it. So use it. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, 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 oh.